It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Grayson Barber. I first met Grayson, um, uh, I think about 12 years ago, when some okay. colleagues and I uh, got into a little bit of a legal complication with the recording industry over a paper that we wanted to publish. Um, at that time, Grayson uh, volunteered very uh, generously to be part of our legal team. Um, and working together with some other lawyers, we were able to, uh, along with Grayson, we were able to get the ability to publish that paper. So thank you again. Okay. Well done. Um, Grayson also um, was one of the very first fellows at CITP back when we started our fellows program. And um, she's been involved with the center for a long time. She's, um, I think, um, a close friend of the center. And I'm not just saying that because she has a active drone capability. Um, <laughs> this is um, a well-attended uh, lecture. We have uh, a topic that's of great current interest, and she brought toys. So I'm not going to uh, delay the start of the talk anymore. Grace OK, great. OK, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'm Grayson Barber. I'm a local attorney. And uh, I appreciate Ed uh, referring to the Felton versus RIAA case. And actually, if, if you don't mind, Ed, I'm going to elaborate on it just a little bit. Because even though I feel like it's in my recent past, for a lot of the students here, it's, it's ancient history. I mean, 12 years ago, you know, it was a long, long time for them. Um, the uh, the uh, recording industry had a new bit of uh, technology they were calling digital watermarks and uh, issued a contest to say, boy, you know, we think our uh, digital watermarking is really, really secure and music CDs will never be uh, uh, tinkered with again. And um, we, we defy anyone to defeat our digital watermarks. So I think Ed and his students did it in, what, 20 minutes or something. It didn't, it didn't take long and uh, wanted to publish their their paper, whereupon the RIAA, RIAA said, if you publish your paper on how you defeated our digital watermarks, we're going to sue your pants off. And uh, so Ed and his students decided, and I think there were some other professors here too, said, you know, it's, it's time to challenge the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And so they did. Uh, the heavy lifting was being done by the Electronic Frontier Foundation out in San Francisco. But they, le they needed local counsel in New Jersey. So that was me. I became the attorney of record for the uh, Felton versus RIA case. And um, we, we lost uh, because once the lawsuit was filed and things started uh, actually uh, taking action, the RIA said, Oh, there, there's some terrible mistake. We never intended to stop you from publishing your paper. No, 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 you've got it all wrong. So um, we, I, I continue to think that that was a very righteous case and very, very lucky to have been involved in it. And um, I'm a big fan of Ed's and of the Center's. All right, let me tell you about the trajectory of my remarks and what I figured we would do today. Um, Obviously, we have to fly the drone. And I have a little bit more footage I want to show you. Um, I, uh, I want to show off the cameras of this thing. And then I thought I would uh, do the demo from the drone cameras. And then since I'm a lawyer and not so much a techie person, you guys can tell me a lot more than I can tell you about the capabilities of these drones. Um, I mistakenly titled my talk, Drones Are Like Flying Computers. That's clearly wrong. Drones are flying computers. And uh, you know, we didn't like the Google vans that went around picking up payload data from the streets. Uh, but now, why not send out a drone to pick up your payload data? Um, why couldn't the police use face recognition software or gate analysis uh, to you know, really keep an eye on what everybody's doing? So the capabilities of these flying computers are enormous. They've been hacked in military uh, operations. And they're going to get smaller, cheaper, and more ubiquitous. So all of the attributes that we can attach to computers, we can certainly attach to drones. But I'm a lawyer. So what I thought I would talk to you about that I know that probably would be of interest to you is that there are three bodies of law that will inform the Federal Aviation Administration when it issues its rules uh, next year. Uh, it's due to have its rules out in August of 2014. Uh, the FAA has agreed that it will have privacy guidelines uh, for operating drones. But there are three bodies of law that um, will may inform what the FAA rules will be. There would be constitutional law, which limits what the government can do with drones. There's common law, 
which limits what somebody like me can do with a drone. Like if I want to fly this thing up to your second story bathroom window and take photos inside, uh, what's to stop me? Well, there is a body of law that would stop me, and that would be a constitutional law. And I'm, I'm sorry, that would be the common law. And then there's also criminal law. Uh, so I w thought I would talk about those three areas of law and how I think they will inform the rules for the FAA when it finally um, sets them out for drones. And then um, we can take the drone outside and fly it around either in the lobby or we can actually fly it out, uh, out of doors on the lawn. All right, first things first. I'm going to operate the drone. I'm going to fly it just for a few seconds in here. It's going to make your salads of, uh, fly out of your plates. But um, plates let's go. Laps. And your plates fly into your laps. Let's go ahead and get this going. Prepare yeah, prepare your salads. Good. Okay. Sorry, this is taking just a moment, but won't be long. So it's an app. You fly it with your phone. Okay, are we ready? again. Maybe that's enough. Let's see if it got some footage. Try one more time. No. Okay. That clearly will have footage. So we can watch all of this. Stop. Stop. Okay. Enough. I'm going to unplug it. <laughs> All right. Now what I want to show you is the, the, the footage that we got from this thing. And there is some. Okay, this is footage I took just before the talk got started. Um, this is Laura in her office, and this is to show off the, um, the, uh, uh, the cameras in it. So I got a nice picture of Laura, who didn't know I was uh, taping her with my drone, and then I held it up to the window. And you can see that it's really pretty good. We can, you, know, you can see the people walking out of doors. So there's, um, there's one. Here's the one that we filmed just now. No. It may be that. Okay, here we go. Up to the ceiling and then crash. Kaboom! All right. And uh, <laughs> in my feet. Why, thank you. Okay, so now to the current status and uh, the, the areas of law that will govern drones. The current deal is that this, this thing is not really a drone. This is not regulated by the FAA. The FAA only regulates drones that weigh 55 pounds or more. So you can imagine then the FAA estimates that there will soon be 30,000 drones in uh, U.S. navigable airspace. So that's 30,000 things that weigh 55 pounds plus. And we hope that they operate better than this thing, right? Um, uh, the current rules are that you, if you want to operate a drone, and several cities do have them. Miami and um, Houston have their own drones. Uh, the uh, military is using drones. Uh, the FBI 
FBI and the uh, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency are using drones in the United States. These people have to have certificates of authorization to operate their drones in the U.S. They have to use them only in the daytime, and uh, they have to be able to see the drone operating. They have to see it flying. But um, the FAA rules right now just have nothing to say about privacy and how the uh, how uh, privacy law would limit the operation of drones, and they are under a mandate now from Congress to do that. So the first um, area of the law that I think will govern drones has to do with the Constitution. Uh, we have the constitutional provisions would be the Fourth Amendment, the First Amendment, and the Fifth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is our guarantee um, against unreasonable searches and seizures, right? That means that the police cannot do a search with a drone unless they would have a search warrant. And in order to get a search warrant, they'd have to have probable cause to believe that a criminal activity has taken place or is about to take place. Interestingly, a fairly old and obscure ancient doctrine pertaining to the Fourth Amendment is the doctrine of curtilage versus open fields. The open fields doctrine is related to this notion, very popular in the U.S. right now, that when you're in a public place, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. So that when you're in the open fields, so to say, and the police see that you're up to no good, they're not required to avert their eyes. Around your house, however, there is something called the curtilage. Um, the popular notion right now is that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy the moment you step out your door. Well, that's not really true because the area around your home is called the curtilage. And that just came up last week in a U.S. Supreme Court case involving the dog sniffing uh, of somebody's front door. The police brought a, a, a dog up to the front door. The dog alerted to the presence of pot and the smell coming through the front door. And the U.S. Supreme Court held that that was a search and the police had to get a search warrant. And therefore, they had to let that particular guy out of jail. So the area outside your house is the curtilage, and that's still part of your home. Uh, and presumably, it means that the police would not be able to hover a drone outside your second story bathroom window unless they're they had a search warrant to do that. The First Amendment provisions are, of course, our uh, guarantee of free speech and free religion. And where it, where it pertains most obviously to drones is, the, is freedom of association. So that, for example, if you uh, participate in a political rally, the police would be able to fly a drone overhead and using uh, face recognition software or other, you know, biometric utilities, be able able to see who is present at the uh, political rally. This has something called a chilling effect. And the notion of a chilling effect is that there are things that we can do as part of our exercise of free speech, free religion, and other constitutional rights that are perfectly legal. But if people think the police are watching, they won't do it. So arguably, engaging in a political rally is a kind of political speech. We value that in the United States. It's perfectly legal perfectly legal to go to a house of worship, perfectly legal to read whatever it is you want to read. And if people become afraid to do these things, that's a chilling effect that violates uh, the First Amendment. Then the Fourth Amendment, I mean, excuse me, the Fifth Amendment has the takings clause. You're familiar with this, right? The takings clause that if the, uh, if the government takes your property, they have to pay you uh, fair compensation for that. Here's uh, an explanation of the current status of that with respect to drones. Um, I've got some Latin here. I'm a lawyer, so I have some Latin for you. I don't know how to pronounce this. Anybody know how to pronounce uh, Latin? It looks like cuius ad solum eus est usque ad celum? Celum? Celum. Celum, okay. This is the idea that um, if you own property, your ownership extends to the middle of the earth and upward into the heavens. But what happened in the 1940s is the military built an air, uh, an, uh, an airport landing place near um, poor Mr. Cosby's chicken farm. And every time mir uh, military airplanes flew above the chicken farm, at least a dozen chickens lost their lives because they panicked and flew into the wall of the chicken coop. So Mr. Cosby sued, saying that this was a taking, that he couldn't operate his chicken farm. Uh, he did not get full compensation. The Supreme Court didn't go so far as to say it was a taking. But they did say 
that it was a servitude upon the land and he was entitled to compensation of some kind. So with respect to a takings claim, uh, we're probably out of luck because the notion of ownership up into the heavens is no longer with us. It's been compromised by air traffic. And the questions would be, at least with respect to government deployment, is whether planes fly directly overhead, uh, how low they fly, how high, how frequently, and then whether the flights uh, create a direct and imminent interference with the use and enjoyment of surface land. So the second body of law that would inform drone use is common law. Uh, the common law is, is tort law, and it applies to people like you and me and what we can do um, just in, relationship, in relation to one another. So the common law torts uh, having to do with drones will be trespassing, stalking, harassment, voyeurism, and a nuisance. Um, to focus on trespassing for just a moment, and I'll come back to that slide, uh, trespassing is very close to the takings notion, right? That um, now a, a property owner owns only as much air space above his property as he can practicably use. And so if a homeowner wanted to complain that a drone is trespassing on the property, you've got a number of problems. You'd have to prove that the drone interfered with, with the enjoyment and use of the property and that that uh, and, and he'd therefore be entitled to damages. But back to these other common law torts, stalking, right? Um, why couldn't that be a reasonable claim against using a tort? I see your hand. I'll call on you in just a moment. Harassment, voyeurism, nuisance. But we have very, very si significant problems with the common law torts. One of them is figuring out who's flying the drone, right? So if I'm flying my drone up to your second story bathroom window, you know, how are you going to know that it's me, right? So very, very hard to recover for uh, any uh, damages for that. Um, again, the factors that would be considered by a court are the location of the intrusion, the degree of offensiveness, and the standard that applies is the so-called reasonable person standard, about which more in just a few minutes. The biggest problem that we have in tort law in the United States is the problem of measuring damages. Americans are fixated on money, right? And so if you don't have a financial loss or some kind of physical injury, uh, very likely you'd be kicked out of court because they'd say, well, what's your injury? There's no problem. You know, this notion of harm to your reputation is not um, considered particularly valuable in the United States at this time. I'm hoping that Ryan Kahlo is right when he says that drones will make us all think uh, a lot harder about what, we've, you know, what we value and what our privacy rights should be. Okay, you had a question. So I was just wondering now, drones, if, if they are to become commonplace, and if uh, individuals are allowed to own them, then in your use of the heavens, you know, the, the, the space about that column, about uh, your land. Would you say that it interferes with your use of drones that you could be flying over your property? Okay, so the question is, um, with the notion that drones are going to become ubiquitous, they're, they're going to be used everywhere, um, and uh, relating that to the notion that you own some of the airspace above your property, um, was, let me see if I'm phrasing this correctly. Uh, is there some argument that, that you could be stopped from flying your own drone in your own airspace? You know, is, if, if, uh, if a regulation impairs your ability to fly your own drone in your own backyard, am, am I asking? No. Well, what I meant to say was that could you then say that I, it's a problem if someone else were to fly their drone over my airspace? Yes, that's what I'm talking about. The question is, right, whether... Uh, if somebody else flies their drone over my airspace, would I be able to stop them? This is, this is the question. This, this is the unresolved question. This is what the FAA is going to have to rule on in the next year or so. I mean, it's supposed to rule by August of 2014. Um, but what I'm saying is that with respect to the law that exists on the books today, we have these rights. They are not... Um, particularly strong. We have these rights, but, but we need people to advocate for them. Um, another area of tort law, these are, these are 
the privacy torts, they're often called the Prosser torts, named after the, uh, the guy who wrote the Law Review article identifying these as specific torts. They are recognized in New Jersey, um, but again, they're considered fairly weak and it's very hard to prove them. One is intrusion upon seclusion, and that's what uh, the question addressed, is that you're minding your own business, you're not you know, you're just trying to enjoy your life in your own backyard, and a drone comes flying overhead. Well, wouldn't that be an intrusion on your seclusion? Seems like yes. Uh, what comes to mind for me is the paparazzi, right? Uh, there is an anti-paparazzi law. That's in the, the next body of law I will talk about, which is criminal law. But intrusion upon seclusion is a recognized tort, and if you can prove all the elements of the tort you can recover if you've had some damage. But proving damages is very hard because damage to your reputation is hard to prove in the United States. Okay, public disclosure of private facts. That would be the harm that would flow from, for example, disclosing that somebody has Hansen's disease that uh, was previously known as leprosy. You know, that, that um, something that's considered sensitive even if it's true uh, there can be damage if it's disclosed. False light publicity is related to that. It's the damage that flows from having true facts revealed but which paint a picture that is, you know, highly misleading. And then finally, appropriation of name and likeness. Um, that's uh, vigorously exercised by the estate of Elvis Presley, which uh, receives uh, licensing fees from every Elvis impersonator in Las Vegas. So these are the privacy torts. Okay, and then finally, there's statutory protection. Um, so we've got these bodies of law. Constitutional law is the rules that limit what the government of the United States can do with its drones and in general. We've got common law, which limits what everybody in this room can do with respect to each other. And then statutes are when the legislature gets together and says, look, this is what the rules are going to be, and if you violate these rules, you're looking at criminal penalties. So uh, there are some statutes. We have the Peeping Tom statute. Um, there's an anti-paparazzo statute in California. There's harassment uh, statutes. Wiretapping is statutory and it applies only to um, sound recordings, not visual recordings. And just to give you an example of uh, what these are, the Peeping Tom statute, um, this is New Jersey's. Uh, this answers the, you know, the example I keep giving of, of looking in um, the window prohibits a person from peering into a window or dwelling of another under circumstances in which a reasonable person in the dwelling would not expect to be observed. So there's your reasonable person standard. And then the anti-paparazzo statute. I, I know that this is too much for a PowerPoint slide, but it's on the books in California, and so far it has withstood um, a First Amendment challenge. So it, it, it seems to have survived so far. Um, Let's see, well, the guts of it are, you know, if, if, if the plaintiff had a reasonable expectation of privacy through the use of a visual or, and somebody invades it through the use of a visual or auditory enhancing device, regardless of whether there's a physical trespass, if the image, sound recording, or physical impression could not have been achieved without a trespass unless the visual or auditory enhancing device was used. So this is very clearly aimed at the paparazzi use of drones. You know, a question I have right now, maybe I'll, I'll put it out to you, is about ATM machines. So let's say a drone was hovering over your shoulder and watching you withdraw money from the ATM. I mean, it seems like the initial reaction would be this popular notion in the United States that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy if you're in a public place. So I'd say, well, you're in a public place. Therefore, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy if you're using an ATM, right? So you have that on the one hand, but then to be lawyerly on the other hand, you think, well, wait a minute, we use ATMs all the time, and we do expect our use of those to be private, and we're using a PIN number, so maybe that should be uh, an invasion of privacy. Yes? Did the bank have some expectation that the ATM is within their own privilege? Does the bank have an expectation that the ATM is in its curtilage? 
functionally to block your view from certain angles, but also to indicate that you should expect. Right. So Josh, Josh points out that um, the, the bank has um, little privacy screens, and why couldn't the area immediately surrounding the ATM be considered sort of the bank's curtilage? Well, under Fourth Amendment law, and I, I do acknowledge that this is a very old notion from hundreds of years ago, but the curtilage is something that applies to the home, not to a place of business. And the bank certainly has a camera trained on people who are using the ATM, but that's to watch the people who are using the ATM, not to watch the uh, entry of the PIN number. Well, I'm going to make an argument, and Scott, I see your hand, but um, uh, hold, hold on just a moment, because I want to make another argument here, and I realize that I'm in the minority, but I want to I share this with you, because I think it's a point worth taking, is that maybe we do have an expectation of privacy in public. You know, if you're walking down Nassau Street, and some stranger walks up to you and says, who are you? You have every right to say none of your business. If a police officer walks up to you and says, who are you? You have every right to say to the police officer, none of your business. This is America, doggone it. This is where we get to walk along the, in public without having to show our papers unless there's some evidence of criminal activity. So we have something. We have some kind of expectation of privacy. It doesn't all vanish the moment we uh, step outside our front door. So I think that there is space, even in American jurisprudence, to have some laws that govern the use of drones. Okay, Scott, I'm, I'm going to take your question, and then I'm going to very, very quickly run through my recommendations to the FAA of what the rules should be, and then we can take the drone outside and fly it. So, yeah. So my only observation was the, the case um, when you have to enter your PIN when you're uh, buying something at the grocery store, and all, all above there's rows and rows of cameras. Okay. So theoretically, all those cameras are watching PIN numbers, or could, <coughs> could be watching them, because you'll often see little notes, at least at the grocery stores I go to, cover your, cover your, you know, the screen while you enter your PIN. Now, I agree, I'd like to have an expectation of privacy, but I, I don't think I have one. Okay. Um, I should repeat the questions, right, for recording purposes? It's okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So the question is, when you're at the grocery store and you're, um, you know, at the cash register, and you know that there are cameras overhead that are, re that are recording your activities at the counter, and you can shield uh, your, uh, what you're doing when you're putting in your PIN number, and wh what about the presence of cameras in the grocery store? Well, those are obviously deployed by the grocery store. They are, and the grocery store has set up things to enhance its own uh, commercial transactions. This isn't a drone that's being operated by the government or by somebody like me who is interested, who would be interested in stealing. Now, maybe the grocery store wants you to shield the PIN number that you point in because they think that some grocery store employees might steal the PIN number. <coughs> but um, drones obviously introduce a whole new dimension to this because, as I say, they're going to be smaller and more ubiquitous. Yes? If, if you're at the ATM and someone without a drone just gets very close to you and looks over your shoulder, do you have any recourse against that? Because that would seem to be analogous, right? No, yeah, that is analogous, right, yeah. exactly. Well, you, you tell me, do you think you have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you're at the ATM? I think you do. I think, I think you have an actual expectation of privacy, and I think it's reasonable. And therefore, I think that there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my recommendations, and I see we have more, uh, more hands, okay? So I'll try to keep this quick. My recommendation to the FAA when they issue their rules uh, for, dr for drones really have to do with transparency and accountability. I think that if the government is going to deploy drones, the government should specify what the purposes are of the drones. They should do this as openly as they can. They should describe the purpose to have, oh, this is uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. And the other acronym you'll see a lot is UAS, which is the Unmanned Aerial Vehicle System. Okay? They should publish who is getting licenses. But I realize this is, this is touchy uh, uh, territory, right? Because publishing the licenses of gun owners has been you know, highly, uh, 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 what, what's, what's the word? Controversial. Controversial. Uh, and so I think publishes the, publishing the license of, 
licenses of drone owners might be very controversial as well. They should publish guidelines for, you know, what are the guidelines for operating drones? Under what conditions would you lose your license to operate a drone? They should have a record retention policy for the government. If the government is filming everything, how long will they keep those records? Um, there should be grounds for revoking uh, certifications and licensing. There should be audit and oversight procedures to make sure that the, uh, whoever is deploying drones is using them properly. Um, I think that there should be a warrant requirement. I think they should establish what the consequences are for violating the rules. Um, they should keep statistics. How many arrests are being accomplished? Uh, by use of drones. How many trials have actually been had as a result of evidence gathered using drones? How many convictions have been obtained thanks to drones? There should be a ban on weaponization in the U.S. And these are the biggies, actually. A private right of action for injunctive relief and damages. That means that you don't have to wait for the Attorney General to take action. That citizens like you and me would be able to sue if we think that we've been hurt by deployment of a drone. And then there should be an exclusionary rule that if evidence is gathered in violation of court rules, that that evidence could not be introduced in court. Okay, that concludes my prepared remarks and now I know we have a lot of questions. Okay, so who, Marty, you had your hand up and I see Thank yours you. and, and who else? Quite a few else. So um, I'll t do yours and then do you think there's any argument that the aggregate problem uh, is one that requires protection, by which I mean the U.S. law is very individual, harm-based, uh, whereas here, even if it were regulated, I can see like, you know, thousands of regulated drones taking pictures of everything. You know, in Europe, that would fly as an argument that would be an aggregate harm. In the U.S., there's almost no laws that protect the guy constitutionally. Do you think there's any way to make an argument that just sort of this kind of surveillance has, it's like a penumbra, and it has chilling effects, not because of the individual damage, but because if you have this level of surveillance, and even if the drones are regulated, this level of accumulation of you know, everybody's backyard is uh, harmful, or is this like given U.S. legal framework, just you know, we're going to apply Okay, so uh, I don't know if, if people are aware, but U.S. law governing privacy and European privacy law are very, very, very different. In the United States, we do have this kind of funny patchwork of protections for, uh, for certain aspects of privacy, but until very recently, your video rentals were protected much, much more than your health records, for example. So there will be these, you know, there's not, not very much protection, whereas by contrast, in the European Union, any collection of personally identifiable information is protected. And instead of tr treating personal information as a commodity to be purchased and sold, which is what we have in the U.S., it's considered something that has to do with uh, your fundamental dignity as a human being. And if, um, if that information is handled improperly, there are uh, violations. So the question is, you know, maybe, uh, maybe drones now can be a catalyst for having a stronger privacy protection in the U.S., and maybe we could have broader protection for uh, personally identifiable information. That's one of the recommendations that has come out of um, the, um, the congressional office that has done research on drones, and they've said that, yes, when um, when drones will be gathering personally identifiable information, that should be one of the aspects of drone deployment that should be governed by the FAA rules and there should be parameters around it, like what the situations are in which personal information can be gathered, how long it can be stored, who will have access to it, what entities will have the authority to say that, yes, you can collect this information, who has the right to, to pull the plug on it. So it may be right. The, the great scholar of, um, of robotics and drones is, is Ryan Kahlo. Um, and he, he, he has predicted that, that the drones will be the catalyst for um, reevaluating privacy law. I have cases of social security numbers with pretty good reliability. I mean, I'm just thinking this, if this doesn't freak people out, what is the threshold that would be? Right. Because there's so many technological things coming together right at the moment. Well, yeah, think, think, think of all the things. We have see-through imaging. Okay, so if we have these uh, naked body scanners at the airport, right, why not mount them in your drone? 
You know, why, why, couldn't you do, why couldn't a terrorist use a drone? Why not use a drone for stalking? You know, you have uh, drones for um, spraying tear gas on the people who were uh, rioting in uh, the, the, the video clip I showed you before we formally got started. Um, why not use a drone to intercept cell phones? You know, drones can be used for an awful lot of purposes, and we don't, in the U.S., we don't really have parameters yet, and maybe this is uh, the opportunity. It's very peculiar. I'm, I'm sorry, I do see hands. It's very peculiar that this would be under the auspices of the FAA. And in fact, the FAA resisted for a long time saying, listen, our mandate is to govern safety in the skies. We care about safety. We don't really care that much about privacy until Congress forced them. So now they have to. Okay. Um, but, Marty's been waiting a long time. Yeah, just briefly, you were talking about the teller machines and ATMs and so on. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting is you travel across the country where you see the installation of new devices. They're different than the old older ones in this respect. The concept of putting a thing there saying, shield your hand if you're putting in the codes and things really don't work very well. So the latest generation of these devices have over the keypads a cover that's actually there, like an eggshell that does that, so that a camera or somebody from above or at a different angle couldn't see what you're doing. So some of the designs of these things are to provide some more of that confidentiality, that the, the protection that you're talking about. That. Um, is, is something just to, to consider that, we, that we're, we're starting to see with devices today. Yeah, but th uh, right. Thank you very much. And that's true. I, 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 I agree. So um, they're improving the machines um, so that the machines are a lot safer. Uh, it seems to me that we should improve the laws. And one of the um, arguments I've heard a lot is that, oh, technology is developing so much faster than the law. There's really nothing we can do. And I think that's a highly irresponsible uh, attitude. I think that the technology should serve the law and not be used to short circuit it. Yeah, Josh. So I, I guess this is this is either a multi-part question or maybe I'm listening. I'm just the um, so you mentioned it's odd that, that this is under the auspices of the FAA, this rulemaking. Mm -hmm. um, and in your uh, sort of suggestions for what the ideal set of rules would be, there are some things that are clearly under the regulatory authority that's granted to the FAA, like publishing the licenses database. Uh, and some things that are less clear, like creating a warrant requirement for the collection of certain kinds of data, or uh, exclusionary rules for evidence, or um, th you know things of that nature. Or pri private right of action for, for um, privacy violation. And I guess my question is, the biggest difference like the FAA rules are going to cover drones of a certain size, but to me the biggest difference between drones of this size and a 55 pound drone is endurance, right? The um, bigger drones can fly for longer. And, but you can do almost anything with these small drones, and people build small drones that have an endurance of half an hour. Mm -hmm. And you can go pretty far in half an hour at the speed of these things. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like Whatever harms might be fixed by the rulemaking, um, they're going to still happen by non-covered drones. And so the question is, are there ha harms that you think exist that would be fixed by the rulemaking, or is the rulemaking just doing things like publishing the license database and sort of allowing for a certain kind of transparency for large drones from police departments, for example? Well, these are, these are great questions, and I, I, I think it remains to be seen. Um, the federal government has had so much trouble with privacy law that for a long time, um, well, maybe not for a long time, but last year, the proposal was to put uh, the privacy concerns related to drones in the hands of the Federal Trade Commission since the FTC was the only organization that seemed to be actually taking action on privacy. But somebody somewhere recognized that maybe the FAA should have something to say about it. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Oh, the, you know, <laughs> the different kinds of drones are amazing. There's some that are as small as hummingbirds, right? And then there's some that are the size of jets. And they are jets, right? So. Um, they're quite, there's uh, an organization called the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, called AUVSI, and they have an industry code of conduct for drone deployment. And at a press conference um, I attended recently, they spoke and they said that drones will provide more jobs 
in the United States. <laughs> Wonderful. So, yeah, yeah lots of them. Okay, so yeah. will, oh. so will legalizing drugs, by the way. Yeah. So do we, do we know the size of the private market for drones and who's buying them and what they're using them for? Is there a big corporate market? Is there a, a big uh, militias buying them? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. So I, I bought mine a year ago from Amazon.com. This thing cost $300. Um, I'm sure that there's a huge range available now and probably do-it-yourself kits. So I don't know. Do you One know? thing I read just yesterday, and that was that Boeing purchased a company that manufactures drones. The number of drones that they make exceeds all any other aircraft that Boeing has ever manufactured before. Already. Okay. And they acquired that company just a couple of years ago. Okay. What about Google looking at my backyard and making pictures available? Sure. Sure. Why not? Why wouldn't Google do that? Okay. Let's let's talk a little bit, and then we we really have to go and and fly. But let's talk a little bit about the um, some of the good things that can be done. So obviously we can use uh, drones to watch the police for aerial photography. This is going to change the lives of surveyors, cinematographers, and real estate. Uh, spotting wildfires, terrific. Um, creating wireless hotspots. Why not? You know, after we had Hurricane Sandy. Um, and, you know, electric was out, why not deploy drones and create a virtual grid? You could have a drone, you know, every so many feet and just fly overhead and provide, you know, utilities for the community. Monitoring traffic, search and rescue, assessing natural disasters, measuring greenhouse gases, tracking endangered animals. So there are wonderful, wonderful uh, applications for drones. You know, they could follow a car. The problem is that you could follow all cars. So, and even though this, you know, my, my toy drone here, which is not regulated by the FAA, but you saw the cameras on it, and you can ask at what point a toy becomes a tool, right? So they really are flying computers. Okay, last few questions, then we, sh we should really go out. What is the, the, the range and the time? That you can fly the drone. Oh, this one, um, my my little three hundred dollar drone. Um, you, it will. This battery will fly for fifteen minutes. How much can it carry? Probably, like, what's the weight? That this can carry? Yeah. I have no idea. Okay. It's it's pretty light. I just looked yeah. into this. Oh, do you know? Um, and people claim that, that this particular drone can lift uh, about two hundred grams in excess of itself and the um, the outdoor shell, which you had out before, but no. Right. Um, the people have built small drones for under a thousand dollars with two kilogram uh, heavy lift capacity. Okay, I see it's more. Not huge, but it's significant. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see your hand, but so you've had your hand up a lot before, right? So, yeah. Put it briefly. But you mentioned in the beginning of the presentation the attribution issue and how hard it is to see who's actually doing activities. And I'm wondering how much of our debate on privacy and privacy and, and legal recourse assumes that, and how much, um, you know, if it's operated from another country, how much of, of domestic law really applies to this new development, or how do we square those two, the fact that you can operate it from, from afar? Great question. It's a great question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, in terms of policy, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of policy I'm also wondering about the notion of self a stranger in your home, you have a different set of rights than if you see a stranger on the street. So if you see a drone, say, in your personal airspace, would you have the right then to yeah. sort of defend it, shoot it down with a, you know, with a gun, a rock, a slingshot, something like that? Does that get into property issues? That might be another whole that's a, that's another. That's another great question. Re repeat the question. The, the question is, what um, rights do you have to, to defend your property against drones? Um, if somebody flies a, a drone into your personal space, but if you, cl you know, clobber the drone, I have to say, you know, with respect to gun control, I actually want to take guns away from people. I, you know, I, I'm way, way, way over uh, on a far end of the spectrum. But yeah, throwing a rock at it or a slingshot, that's uh, extremely, it's the first time a, a, a gun has had any attraction for me at all, to shoot down the damn thing. Okay, who a question here. Yes. Uh, do any of the laws on corporate espionage apply in this space? Corporate espionage. 
Wonderful. Yet another application for drone technology. And it will be so interesting to see what the FAA does in its rulemaking. Okay, time to go out? All right.